Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to welcome you to the um, UNM Art Department Gale Memorial Speaker Series. This is our kickoff date. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Uh, my name is uh, Gigi Yu. I'm an art education professor um, here at UNM. And um, I'm so glad you could join us. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this series before we get started. Um, this is going to be an online series and will be um, uh, taking place throughout this school year, the 2021 school year. And it's an opportunity to um, investigate and interrogate these different spaces within art education, art museums, pre-K through 20 classrooms and systems, and art-based community settings. So the title of the series is actually uh, Interrogating Spaces, Alternative Discourses in Art Education. Um, the art educator, art, we'll be hearing from art educators from working within different contexts that will pose questions, promote alternative, alternative discourses, towards learning and civic engagement. Um, a particular focus will be on contemporary art pedagogical practices that promote curiosity, participation, and encourage dialogue. So I think this series is particularly timely for educators in all disciplines as we think through the current times and um, of mass equal, equilibrium that we're all experiencing and disruption as we try to reimagine and think forward. Um, I, I just also want to highlight a couple events that are coming up really soon. One is part two of this uh, conversation about the remix room. Next week, September 24th, Thursday evening, we'll be talking with some of the instructors that worked with um, Leon De La Rosa Carrillo, who's speaking today, on the projects that we did with our students um, based on the, the remix room. So please mark your calendars for that. I will send out a special invitation to everyone who's on the call today. And then on October 23rd, we'll be hearing from Dr. Amy Crahey, who's the Associate Professor of Art and Visual Culture Education and Graduate Advisor at the University of Arizona. And she's going to speak about arts equity, re-envisioning the artist educator um, pipeline. So that should be exciting also. So to get us started, um, if you wouldn't mind just keeping yourselves on mute during the presentation, and if you have questions to place them in the chat, box and we'll address them after, um, after the presenters present. And to get us started, I just want to say a couple thank yous. I want to thank Rebecca Martinez, a graduate student in art education. She is um, helped a lot with promoting the events and also with Devin Karachi from the um, UNM Art Museum. She also helped promote and um, she's here today to also record and Paloma Lopez, who you'll hear from in a minute, she's going to introduce the speaker. She's a UNM graduate student in um, museum studies. And most of all, I'd like to thank Susan Anderson and the art department here at UNM. And um, if, what I'd like to do is also thank the art muse, the UNM Art Museum. And I'd like to introduce RF Khan, the director of the art museum. He's going to just speak for a moment about this particular project. And um, I want to welcome RF wherever you are on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Gigi. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Arif Khan, and as Gigi said, I'm the director of the uh, UNM Art Museum. Um, we are honored to work with, with you, Gigi, and the Department of Art, of Art on this uh, lecture series. Um, just wanted to say a few words about the evolution of the Remix Room. Um, on February 7th is when we opened the exhibition um, in person and had a great turnout there. Um, we had a wonderful series of events and class visits planned throughout the last spring semester. But unfortunately, as we all know, due to the pandemic, we uh, closed the museum less th in less than a month on March uh, 12th. Um, our curator of education, Tracy Quinn, worked with Leon and quickly pivoted to reaching out to faculty and students to try to make the Remix Room the engagement project it was intended to be, even if it was virtually. So I thank them very much for that. Um, as well as the faculty, uh, Megan Jacobs, GGU, who um, helped work with uh, Tracy and Leon um, to still engage their students during um, the early days of the pandemic. Um, I also wanna acknowledge and thank uh, Leon again for working with us over the past few months to make uh, the Remix Room into uh, one of our first virtual exhibitions, which you can find on our website. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet or didn't get the chance to see it in person, that's a great way to 
uh, view the exhibition and learn more about the themes and ideas that Tracy and Leon put together. So in conclusion, I just really uh, can't thank Tracy and Leon enough for their professionalism, their creativity. Um, it was the early days of the pandemic and um, I was just so impressed and thank you so much for um, working and trying to keep the museum relevant and engaging the students and faculty at the University of New Mexico. Thank you so much. Great, so I'll turn it over to Paloma and she's going to introduce the speakers. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm pleased to introduce our, our speakers today. We'll begin with Leon de la Rosa Carrillo. He is a remixologist and pedagogue. He has been professor and researcher in the art department at the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez since 2005, where he leads courses on audiovisual art, ethics, and contemporary image theory. His videos, poetry, glitches, multimedia performances, and pedagogies have been shared in Mexico, the United States, and Germany, among other places. His PhD in art history and education is from the University of Arizona, where he researched the language of internet memes. He recently co-curated Rafael Lozano Hammer, Hammer's border tuner, Sintonizador Fronterizo on the Juarez El Paso border, and coordinated the Cierto Arte Archivo, a collaborative art space research inquiry into the aesthetics, ethics, and teachings of the Chihuahuan Desert. His most recent solo exhibition is The Remix Room as part of the UNM Art Museum's Creative Residency. Welcome, Leon. Um, next, we have Tracy Quinn. She was the former Curator of Education and Public Programs here at the University of New Mexico Art Museum in Albuquerque. She has worked in museums and community-based organizations for over 12 years and has experience teaching K-12 and university art and art education courses. She received her PhD in Art History and Education with an emphasis in art and visual culture education from the University of Arizona. Her career and research interests center on the shifting expectations and modes of educational work in museum spaces, the museum educator's position and experience within these changing museum paradigms, the integration of art education into exhibition spaces, and the inter, trans, and undisciplining potential of arts education within art institutions. Welcome, Tracy. And last but certainly not least, we have Bianca Castillero. She is an art educator who lives and works in Mexico City. She has a bachelor's degree in visual arts and a master's degree in art history, both from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Her work addresses the relationship between textile art and education. Her research was recent, recently published by the Ibero Americanische Institute of Berlin. She has presented on the annual textile festival in Mexico City and an international meeting of Mesoamerican textiles, which took place in the Museo de Textiles de Oaxaca. She was recently accepted into the Language, Literacy, and Sociocultural Studies doctoral program here at UNM. Welcome, Bianca, and thank you all for joining us. Can you all hear me? Yes, I um, can hear you. Great, I had some tech issues, so I'm very nervous about the uh, having everyone hear me, but um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm like super happy to be here virtually and I see a lot of um, familiar names and uh, in the audience. So um, I wish we could be together in person. Um, so just to give you a, a little bit of um, what to expect today. So I'm going to introduce um, the idea of the residency program that was created at UNM Art Museum when I was there. Um, and then Leon will jump in to talk about how he sort of understood the residency and um, proposed the remix room. Um, and he collaborated with Bianca on one of the projects. And then Bianca's um, going to talk about her sort of um, interpretation of remix and you know as Arif was saying we were hoping to have both Leon and Bianca in Albuquerque with us working with students um, in the spring semester and unfortunately that did not happen but you'll at least get a sense for like what could have happened um, and Leon actually um, did 
work with people virtually. And I couldn't have asked for a better partner to go to a digital platform. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context about uh, where I'm coming from when I'm thinking about the residency and thinking about art education and education in general. So the context of the UNM Art Museum, if some of you aren't from Albuquerque or have never visited us before, we are on um, UNM's campus and uh, UNM is the flagship university in New Mexico and there's over 215 degrees and certificates. So um, our audience, and it's one of the things that as a staff, we talked about identifying audiences and if any of you museum studies students are here you know that's something that museum uh, staff talk about a lot well for us what separates us from you know say the albuquerque museum or 516 arts or any other um, museum in, in the city or state for that matter is we are on a university campus so our students become um, a priority and so that really affects and impacts as an educator, what I'm thinking about. Um, and of course, we still do K through 12 education. We still do pro public programs, um, lectures, workshops, all that good stuff, right? But having a campus where you're looking at students in architecture, students in environmental studies, students in chemistry or management or museum studies, Chicana Chicana studies, how as an art museum can you engage these students? Um, and of course, always engaging our College of Fine Arts students, um, which we do all the time. And so this, these sort of different disciplines were very much in uh, the forefront of my mind when I was thinking about um, the residency program. Some of the guiding questions that were also in my head constantly is uh, sort of what is the nature of learning? Um, and if you have ever visited a museum or you're uh, a museum studies um, student or you're working in museums, uh, I think that there are really traditional and, and very uh, tried and true ways of learning in a museum. Um, but I want to continually ask myself, like, what does it mean to learn? And, and what are we doing museums? What do we do well? And what can we do better? And then also, um, how can we become more interdisciplinary, you know, and, and responsive to the entire university? Uh, these are really big questions and you can't hit everything, but it's really fun to try and to start reaching out to, um, you know, de departments that you may not have ever thought of before. So, um, the artist residency took place in uh, what we recently uh, redefined as an, uh, the UNM Art Museum's project space. Um, for those of you that have been on campus, it's the upper gallery. You have to take the elevator to get upstairs. That space used to function as a traditional gallery. Um, and when I was hired at UNM Art Museum, the education room was really a sad space. It wasn't um, much of anything. Actually, right now, it, I, we've turned it in, into a storage closet. Um, but when RF was hired um, as the director, he asked me if I would be interested in, um, you know, using that space for education purposes. And we were already using it for lectures and workshops. And so it made the most sense to sort of, if we were going to give up any um, space in the Museum for Education, this gallery made the most sense. And so we had to redefine it. And uh, recently we, we put this language up in that space so that people could understand, like when they walk in, it's not just art on the wall, what's going on up here. So we created some language to sort of clarify uh, what was happening um, in that space. And so the residency and the project space to me go hand in hand because we could not do this residency if that space was not defined in these terms. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to read each sentence to you, but you know, I wanted a space where we could be adaptive and that we could sort of use the space as a studio or a gallery or a learning center. We could host um, students in there consistently um, without worrying about damaging um, objects. I wanted to uh, center the artist as a teacher, and I'm going to get more into that in a minute. Um, I wanted it to be participatory, uh, a space where people could come in and 
leave their own mark or their own stories um, and interpretations of material. Uh, I already mentioned that I wanted it to be interdisciplinary um, and I wanted um, it to be unpredictable and unexpected. And sometimes, you know, it, it really was. Um, there were things that happened in the first residency. And of course, with Leon's residency, that um, you kind of just have to think on your feet. And, you know, those of you that are familiar with museums, um, we're usually a little slower moving and think projects can take, you know, anywhere from two to three years to materialize. And so it was a really um, an interesting way to work. And it wasn't always comfortable. Um, some other big ideas that I think about when I'm thinking about the museum space and the residency space is I want it to be multivocal and multidirectional. And what I mean by that is um, it's not just the museum's interpretation that's being presented. And so if someone uh, walks into the museum and can include or challenge or whatever, what ideas we're putting forth, I think it becomes a really engaging um, and uh, inclusive space. Um, I see the museum as an invitation, um, again, to sort of stay a while, uh, to talk back at the ideas that are presented, to reject those ideas. Like I really think, to me, that's an important part of um, not only museums, but education. I mean, it's, it's really, I think they're um, connected in, um, in a lot of ways. I also want people to think and see that a museum is actually a process. You know, when you walk into an exhibition, it's often, you know, very, I mean, that's the point, like things are presented, very, they're organized. It's like a, a space that a lot of people go to sort of sit and rest with ideas. Um, but all of that is, uh, there's so many process that, processes that get, go into that sort of final product. And so, I want people to realize that museums are not fixed spaces and they're not stable, um, even though sometimes they might feel that way. Um, I want museums to be responsive to uh, their public. Um, and I also think the idea of ideas driving um, the creation of content is really um, important. And I'm not saying that museums don't already do that. Uh, but the focus on the object in the upper gallery really um, sort of shifted and it wasn't so object oriented. And you'll see what I mean in a second. And then, you know, something else that as I was thinking about being engaged um, with the public and especially uh, a university public, um, a lot of, you know, the, the big words that we hear when people talk about the college experience or the skill sets that they want students to take away. Um, I think artists already do this. You know, I think artists are creative thinkers, they're researchers, they are inquisitive and curious and they generate ideas all the time. And so to me, an artist is a perfect um, person to engage with, with students who are expected to do these things. So that's where the residency came into uh, to play for me. And I wanted this residency to be based in education um, and the idea that any artist that we bring to the table or to the museum for a semester is brought here with the understanding that they will be um, teaching um, students. So the first resident that we had and some of you have seen this and saw the installation um, was Nina Elder, who is um, an Albuquerque artist. She's based in Albuquerque, but she travels all over um, the United States and world um, researching um, the, envir the environmental, the impact that humans have had on the environment. And that's a very simplified, overly simplified uh, definition of her work. But just to give you some sort of sense, um, she's really interested in um, our current state of, in the ecological crisis that we're in and how um, humans have uh, attributed to that. So this is, these are a couple of installation shots. And to the right, you see these two uh, drawings. They're charcoal, well, they're actually not charcoal. They're made with different material like glacial silt. And I can't remember what the other one was, but Nina uses um, material that she mines herself and gets from the earth herself. Um, 
And then those are the only two pieces of her art that were ever on display in the museum. And so this is what I'm saying, I'm shifting away from the object and more into sort of the artistic process and the artist's mind. Um, the image on the left hand of the screen is a sample. She kind of wanted to create her studio and all of those pictures on the wall are years and years of research. Um, so you get a glimpse into how she works as an artist. Um, but she proposed to me, you know, I met her and I loved the way she thinks. She's an incredible thinker. She's so inspiring. She's so energetic. Her ideas are really, really smart. Um, and I knew she would be perfect for engaging our students. And um, she proposed this idea of uh, the deep time lab. Um, and she wanted to engage students with this idea of time and how um, our concept of time as humans is really, you know, minuscule, super, super tiny. And the impact that we've had on earth is enormous, you know. So we reached out to um, over 20 faculty. Um, and Nina, because she lived in Albuquerque, was able to engage with a lot. Um, and at times I had to sort of tell her, you know, we don't, we're not paying you to work full time. You have to like, at some point, you really have to like step back and don't overdo it. Um, but her energy was incredible and she wanted to work with um, students. And so she worked with, with people all over campus. She worked with students in architecture and planning. She worked with students in environmental studies in Native American studies, in um, the Honors College, there were several classes that participated. Um, and those students and faculty brought their interpretations of deep time to the UNM Art Museum space. Um, and so it became this really organic and um, hectic space, and hectic in a good way, you know. Um, she left um, these prompts in the gallery for people to respond to. So it wasn't just about the student participants, but anyone that came to the space could respond to these questions. Um, so the top one says, in this time of rapid change, what do you think needs to be preserved? And then people could uh, leave their mark and their, um, their comments. Um, so this just gives you a little bit of a a glimpse into what the space could look like um, and did look like in deep time. These are some images of Nina and other students and I know they're a little bit blurry but the one on the left there's some stuff hanging on the gallery walls. Those are all student work um, and some of it was poetry, some of it was um, sound art, some of it was photography, some students um, created zines, you know, and it really depended on what the faculty were teaching in their classes and how deep time connected to their curriculum as it already existed. So it takes a lot of uh, listening to faculty, listening to students, and then adapting how and what we're teaching in the museum. So we're not setting the stage, the faculty and the artists are doing that. And the museum is really just making sure that those ideas um, can be met. So that's just a very brief um, and very quick uh, introduction to, to what the residency is really about. Um, so that was the spring of uh, 2019. And when I was thinking about the next um, residency, I immediately wanted to engage with Leon because um, I know Leon's work. We went to um, the U of A together and this idea of remix I think is a really broad concept. Um, it's a very interesting concept and I've seen him teach and I've seen his work and so I knew it would be a really good fit for the UNM Art Museum. Um, and I just have a couple of installation shots, which you might have seen already if you hopped on. Um, but Leon is not based in Albuquerque. So the nature of this residency was already different. So we had to think about, you know, Nina was there almost every week of the semester that she was part of the residency program. 
uh, Leon could not do that because he teaches in Juarez and um, he has a full-time job and he can't be in Albuquerque the whole time. So installation um, felt more traditional in the sense that there were these um, art pieces on the wall, but the labels, and I'm not going to speak too much to this because Leon will get into this in a second, but um, they served as sort of prompts and um, asked questions for people. And the hope was that once Leon was here, the museum would start to fill, or this gallery, I should say, would start to fill with students' interpretation of Remix. And we would be able to incorporate their creative content into the space alongside Leon. So then it becomes a conversation um, with um, students and faculty. So these are some of the, these are the, the four projects. And like I said, Leon will go through that in a second. Um, so yeah, it was really, this is the heart of the residency program. I think it's really interesting and artists are doing incredible research and generating things all the time. And so it's an opportunity for museums to um, just add to the ways that we engage with people. Um, it's not saying that you don't do object-based learning. We already do that and it's successful. And so how can we continue to build upon um, what learning is and how, how people can engage with ideas and bring their thoughts to what we present in the museum. Um, so for Leon, and you could see on the left, that's the, the space with books. We had books, we had chess games because there's a piece in here about chess. Um, we had meme games because Leon remixes memes and um, that's one of the projects that we're going to talk about next week. Um, and you know what was really interesting, both Nina and Leon, when they um, presented their ideas to me, they both started with their proposal was about the curriculum and then the art and how we were going to use the art came after that. So it's sort of putting education um, immediately and, and the ideas like immediately at the front and then sort of picking the things that we're gonna display to um, create the, the education that we're trying to get to or those learning moments. Um, so I'm gonna pass this on to Leon and um, these are the questions that he's gonna answer. So when we, we think about the remix room, what were some of the leading questions? and what were the driving ideas for him as an artist. Hi, everybody. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Leon de la Rosa Carrillo. I, uh, I'm, I'm a professor and researcher at the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez, uh, where I teach a bunch of stuff about uh, media art and video and um, digital stuff. I'm gonna start sharing my screen so I can move along with the presentation. And as Tracy uh, pointed out, my initial response to uh, Tracy's invitation to be part of, of the residency, besides complete excitement, and uh, I gotta say be before I, I move on to my own uh, thing here, when I, I remember visiting Nina's show, and being so overwhelmed and so excited by the notion uh, of, of how messy everything looked there and how alive and how uh, um, uh, um, appropriate for learning it felt. And, 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 and that was one of my biggest kind of like driving forces behind uh, uh, working with Tracy in, in this, uh, in this residency, which again was, was a great opportunity for me to start thinking about remix and remix practices along lines that, that I had always kind of like um, thought about, but never fully put together in, 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 in one single effort and in, in one single kind of drive to communicate to other people about them. Uh, it's really funny because uh, when when Tracy asked me to be part and to 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 propose to the residency, as an educator, my first response was, "Okay, so this is what I want to do. 
I want to explore these two questions. Uh, uh, what are the ethics of remix and can ethics be explored to remix? I'm always uh, fascinated by the uh, idea of ethics within, uh, uh, within art practices, not as morals because ethics have really very little to do with morality. Morality gives answers, ethics asks questions, and I'm much more interested in questions. Um, and uh, when, when I talk about the ethics of remix, I really mean uh, to, to discuss what type of relationships and what type of um, empowerment can individuals adopt or adopt uh, through the practice of remix. In other words, can culture, can dominant culture be rendered more meaningful and more ethical by uh, instead of uh, being top down and vertical and monolithic and unchanging and unflinching, uh, like uh, much like Tracy mentioned, museums are not supposed to be, yet many times they are understood as that. Can remix somehow uh, break kind of like, like, like a, a, a small piece of, of uh, gap in there where this uh, um, apparent uh, 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 monolithic uh, nature can start giving way? to the people's own experience, to personal an anecdotes, to personal meanings. And so these are what I think are the ethics of remix. How can individuals enter relationships with culture? And also the other thing that, that I wanted to, to, to explore with this residency is can ethics in more general terms be explored through remix? Here, I was very interested in uh, what is now known as cancel culture, which is not as new as people would like to, to think, uh, and, and it's, it's not social media's uh, uh, fault. It's just a phenomenon that has become more and more represented and, and more and more visible through social media. But it's, it's a phenomenon that has occurred for ages. Um, and, 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 and instead, and, and I have always understood that instead of um, trying to cancel and delete pieces of culture, maybe we should remix those pieces of culture, those problematic pieces of culture with, uh, uh, with the actual uh, discussion of what is problematic about them. What is problematic about not only the object that certain artists created or that certain entertainer uh, uh, put out there, but also what is problematic about their own lives, what is problematic about th the context in which it was created, and what is problematic about uh, the effects that these objects and these lives kind of put out into the world. And so those were the two main questions that, that, that I, I, I had in mind as I went into thinking about uh, working in this residency. And so in order to work through those questions, I had originally thought of, as an educator, what you always think of is what has other people done? What, what, what have other people done that can be useful and that can be brought into as a point of departure and as a, a trigger for discussions? Uh, and, and, and so when, when I sent, sent out the, the first uh, uh, proposal, I was basically proposing to discuss three, these three objects, uh, quote unquote. Uh, Rebirth of a Nation by uh, Paul D. Miller, uh, also known as DJ Spooky, which uh, uh, remixes Birth of a Nation, which uh, I don't know if, if, if there's any film uh, bobs in, in, in the conference right now, but Birth of a Nation is understood, widely understood as Hollywood's first blockbuster. It is the movie that uh, uh, kind of set up the blueprint for how action film works and how uh, drama and, 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 and action kind of like fit into each other. Uh, it, it is, uh, although it is disputed, it is also given the credit of being, of being one of the first uh, uh, movies that creates action in two different places at the same time. 
something that if you've seen Star Wars, and I'm sure most people have, uh, uh, Star Wars does very well when, when uh, you have the, uh, Darth Vader and Luke fighting in one side, and, and then the Alliance trying to blow up some spaceship on the other side, all happening at the same time. Uh, so Birth of a Nation is given a lot of the credit for, for kind of inventing this form of storytelling. And it is also a particularly offensive racist movie. It is a movie where uh, the KKK are the heroes. And so Paul D. Miller uh, or DJ Spooky takes this, the, 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 this film and remixes it into, uh, uh, by, by, by discussing uh, not, not only the, the, the impact into filmmaking that Birth of a Nation had, but also incorporating the, the discussion of uh, racism and, 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 and how it, it kind of um, installed uh, racist thought and white supremacist thought into uh, movie making into Hollywood. It was also the first film to be screened, to ever be screened in the White House, uh, uh, Birth of a Nation, the, the, the original one. And then the, the second piece that I was really interested in, in, in kind of dissecting uh, was asking for it, which is this performance stand up type of weird uh, 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 event uh, by, by Adrienne Truscott. Uh, she's, she's a stand-up comedian, but, but also a performance artist. And what she did in asking for it was she would take all the traditional male uh, uh, delivered and male written rape jokes that were very uh, 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 popular in, uh, in the early to late 90s or up until the late 90s, maybe even into the 2000s. And uh, she would take these rape jokes and kind of make commentary about them and dissect them and, and uh, distill what's problematic about them. And, and she would sit there in, uh, uh, naked because she, she would do this naked or, or, except for a top. That's all she would wear. And, 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 and she would just uh, kind of go joke by joke and, and, and comedian by comedian that makes the, the, that 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 wrote and made these jokes and sort of dive into them and and and, and create this space for discussion about what is uh, uh, so problematic about uh, uh, rape jokes. And finally, the other event or object that that I was really interested in uh, discussing is what is known now what is now known as the Worcester Art Museum label controversy where um, the then curator of that museum, I think her, her, her first name is Kathy, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Athens, decided to use the labels uh, in, in, in their portrait gallery to not only give uh, information about the year of the portrait or, 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 or the uh, uh, technique or whatever, but also use those labels to discuss how the people being uh, uh, um, portrait there, being photographed, not photographed, but painted, uh, uh, were involved in, 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 in slave trade and how much of their riches, much of their wealth, which made the portrait possible came from slave trade trading. This, of course, became very controversial very quickly, and it opened up a, a lot of questions about whether or not a, a museum was a place to discuss these notions and to discuss the, 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 the history, not only of the object itself, but the context around the object. And so I was really interested in, in, in using these three uh, um, events, objects, uh, pieces of art as uh, uh, um, triggers to then have our uh, di different discussions with as many classes as we could. But of course, uh, and so I, I, I thought of Robert, uh, Robert of a Nation 
that, that as uh, a piece that that would think that that would let us think of remix as commentary as commentary not only on a piece of object which was the film but also on the context that it created asking for it as uh, I, I would I, I was planning to discuss it as re, uh, uh, remix as appropriation where uh, Adrian Truscott actually appropriated these rape jokes and turned them into something meaningful to her and meaningful to her act and all and, and then remix as context uh, uh, for the uh, the label controversy, which created a much larger context than just the object itself. But then, of course, uh, Tracy very astutely uh, uh, reminded me that I was supposed to also make an art show and not just come and talk to students, which, which uh, to be honest with you, is probably my, my talking to students and working with students is my favorite part of my work. Uh, uh, doing art shows, I'm always kind of like eh, iffy about uh, because as I said, I'm always more interested in the questions and I'm less interested in the answers. And art shows more times than none uh, uh, feel like answers and not exactly like questions. And one of the things that Tracy uh, uh, kind of reminded me of is people or a lot of people may still be unsure about what is remix. And so maybe the art show that you can, that, 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 that we can put together can answer the question, what is remix before anything else? And that is how we started thinking of this art show, much less uh, uh, as uh, a gallery show, or at least I thought about it, much more in, the, in, in lines of creating a remix classroom where uh, visitors, participants, students could come into contact with how I had been using Remix throughout my, my, my um, art making career and my art making uh, process. And so I'm gonna now go into the art, the, the, the virtual show itself which uh, uh, many of you may have visited already, but uh, th this, this is gonna uh, kind of serve as, as a little virtual tour. But also uh, I, I wanna point out what were the uh, educational uh, aspects and educational ideas behind the way we work the show. And if you look around, uh, really you see a lot of empty spaces. And uh, that was not accidental. Actually, the, the, all of that middle ground, all of that em, uh, open floor was, me was meant to be used as a, a classroom space. That was meant to, be, you, to, to, to have tables and have people sitting on those tables. And we will be talking about remix while being surrounded by remix pieces. And so, uh, and then this big empty wall here was meant to be uh, uh, to eventually be filled up by student work created uh, in, 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 this, in, in the second part of the residency where I would be working with students. Not, needless to say, uh, that, that ended up not happening. Now, uh, uh, a bunch of other thing did, did, things did happen, which I will discuss in more detail next Thursday, uh, where I worked with uh, a bunch of uh, classes and, and, and educators. But so the first thing that, that, that I wanted my, my remix classroom to have was uh, a nod to uh, Mark America, who is uh, kind of like my guru of remix as far as my education goes. Uh, I didn't study under him, uh, but I, I sort of did by reading his writings and by uh, interacting with his artwork. And so I, 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 this quote of, uh, or this formula of M equals one plus one always becoming is a very concise and, 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 and very kind of elegant uh, definition of remix that I'm be always very comfortable with, where M is stands for many, where uh, one is the, the, the object that, that will be changing eventually as soon as you add something to, to it. For those of you familiar with uh, programming, 
uh, co in, in, in code, th there, there's uh, the formula n plus one also allows for, for constant growth and for generative uh, uh, artwork. And at the, uh, at, at the heart of the matter, Remix speaks to generative artwork and speaks to generative cultural expressions that are always becoming something else, that, have, that, that are always being added to by, by interacting with somebody new, by being meaningful to somebody new, by somebody new appropriating it, making it her own, and then creating and spitting out a new version of itself. And so that, that was kind of like the welcoming mat to, to, to my Remix classroom. But of course, if you enter, you actually will enter through these um, elevator doors. And the first thing that you would start reading uh, is this uh, 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 kind of lengthy exploration of how I thought about Remix as an act of active remembrance. I always like to think of Remix as that conversation you have where uh, uh, some, something that your interlocutor says reminds you of a specific uh, Seinfeld episode that then reminds you of a specific song, that then reminds you of a movie, that then reminds you of a book, that then reminds you of whatever. And that is how Remix works in my own terms and, and, and in my own experience. It is an act of active remembrance where you actively take pieces of culture that remind you of something else and mash them together, maybe uh, with your own experience, to, to come up with something uh, uh, new. And the way that we kind of um, divided up the, the classroom was in, in four different stations, very educator-like, right? And, and the first station that you would encounter was the station that asked you to think of Remix as a way to question and reconsider. And again, I will go deeply, more uh, deeper in, into uh, many of these art pieces next Thursday. But in the meantime, these uh, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, I'm, I'm I'm just gonna think about this each station on its own terms. And this station was meant to to make you think about uh, whether or not you can 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 claim ownership of that which you see and of that which you experience. And what does it take for you to take ownership of the artwork, for example? that you will experience once you visit a museum, once you visit a, a, a gallery. And whether or not that personal experience that you share with that art object and, and the artist that created it is meaningful in ways that go beyond the art piece that you were in front of. What are the questions that you are allowed to ask to these art pieces? What are the, the, the questions that you're allowed to, to explore through these art pieces? And how can you establish conversations with these art pieces? Um, and so that, 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 was, that was the first uh, uh, station. And, and, how, uh, and then if you move along, again, I will go deeper into each one of these art pieces on Thursday, but so this station, presented a bunch of contemporary art being sampled by myself into something new. Then the next station uh, had to do with Remix as a way to disrupt and expand. And here I thought, I, I, I asked the visitor to put themselves in, in, the, in the place of uh, a minor I, 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 that, that cannot help but destroy that which uh, they work with. Miners can, you know, in, in order to, to mine something, you pretty much gotta destroy, you gotta devastate it, right? And, and once you start remixing uh, uh, artwork, once you start remixing culture, you cannot hold it dear. You must be able to as the beats would say, kill your darlings, right? And the more you adore a particular piece of culture, if you are going to remix it, 
then you might have to be willing to break it. And uh, uh, in, in order to do that, I broke not somebody else's piece of work, but actually my own. And this uh, station is based on a book that I uh, uh, wrote and, and created along with Philip Zimmerman, uh, who named Ojala, which I then went ahead and, and, and glitched out, digitized, and turned into something new, into 56 different versions of itself. And then the third station had to do with inviting um, uh, uh, visitors to use Remix as a way to interpret and speculate. Speculation and reinterpretation is probably one of the, or, or, or two of the most important things that, that I can fathom to do with art and to do with art making. The idea of taking an existing piece of culture and turning it into something new by inserting yourself into the narrative that that piece of culture has been telling you all along makes you interpret and makes you speculate what would happen if that piece of culture uh, uh, included you or included your point of view or included a woman's point of view or included a, 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 a uh, uh, an immigrant's point of view, or included uh, a blind person's point of view, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can only do that through speculation, especially if, if, if you're somebody like me who, you know, uh, uh, is, belongs to all these dominant uh, 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 segments of population, light skin, male, cisgender, uh, uh, heterosexual, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you need to speculate through uh, an ethical and a realist stance. Uh, you are not allowed to veer off too much of realism as you speculate. And so what I did for this station that has to do with interpretation and speculation is I worked with, uh, I, I kind of rescued my own work where I uh, uh, question the art museum in Ciudad Juarez, which uh, is, is uh, an art museum that is beautiful in many ways, but it's also extremely problematic in a lot of other ways. And again, next Thursday, I will go deeper into this piece. And the piece that I do want to go a little bit deeper on here tonight, or today, I'm sorry, is uh, the, the, the one that occupies the final station, which had to do with remix-based research. As an academic myself, as th th that also makes art, that also thinks of himself as a remixologist, uh, I cannot help but to understand uh, uh, research mainly through a remix lens, where the researcher is uh, expected to uh, uh, go out and take as much source material as possible and, and, and then find the places and find the ways in which this source material can kind of uh, uh, fit with each other in order to create something new, which would be a new argument, an, a new insight, a new piece of knowledge, a new stance on uh, an old phenomena. And the, this, my, my own stance on the old phenomena that, 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 that I've been wanting to explore for a long time, and this was the only new, the only objectively new piece that, that, that the show um, uh, um, held was the game of chess. Uh, the, the, the game of chess, uh, when I was younger, I used to play a lot of chess. And as uh, some people say, the older I get, the better I was, you know? Uh, and I really enjoyed playing chess. And then I kind of like fell off the chess wagon for a long time. And I, 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 over the last two or three years, I've been kind of like getting back into it. And I've been really fascinated 
by understanding uh, how chess can uh, be also be explored through the lens of remix because at, at the end of the day, a chess player is only as strong as how many patterns and how many, uh, 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 how many moves they can conjure up as the game is happening. So a chess board is already an existing piece of material with a very specific existent uh, uh, pieces or, or objects, which are the pieces, the pawns and the pieces, that then each chess player is expected to move around and to remix, you know, uh, as a way to probe and to find new ways into interacting and into dominating, if you want to say it that, that way, the other person across sitting across the board. But that other person is also trying to do the same. And so what ends up happening in the board is a remix of every single uh, uh, game that both of those players have studied before and have understood before and have played before, but also of their own temperament and of their own playing style and of the own history of chess, which is kind of like laid out in front of, uh, uh, of the players each time a, a, a game of chess happens. And so I went into this uh, long, uh, the, the piece consists of a, 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 a video, which uh, uh, you, you're welcome to, to, to view later on, where I, I'm, I'm playing chess online, but at the same time, I'm listening to music and I'm, I'm understanding uh, 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 internet memes. And I'm also remixing Mark America. Mark America, who I also referenced right uh, at the, uh, uh, on, in the banner, who I quoted in the banner, and uh, uh, who wrote this uh, very uh, seminal book for my own understanding of remix called Remix the Book, and where uh, a particular chapter in it called Source Material Everywhere was particularly important and meaningful to me. And so what I do in this piece, as I'm talking, I'm not only playing chess and I'm not only understanding chess as a remix engine, but I'm also remixing Mark America's source, source material everywhere in ways that are meaningful, not only to my own experience, but also to the game of chess. And then there was also this notion of how can we make chess jump out of the board and, to, and out of the screen and turn it into something tangible and turn it into something not quite as fluid and not quite as uh, liquid as digital online chess can be because you, you know I, I, or video even because I, I, I can just keep mixing it and remixing it all along and for a while i had been uh, having conversations with bianca castillero about the game of chess, and she had expressed uh, uh, interest in <clears throat> maybe tracing chess moves uh, or a chess game on uh, true embroidery, which is one of her uh, favorite media to work with. And so I, as I started developing this idea of uh, every game of chess ever played is a remix, I started thinking about, well, what, what could be, uh, 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 or we started thinking about how can we accompany this video uh, so, so that, is, uh, uh, th that it somehow transcends the screen. And the way that, that, that we thought about it is uh, through uh, uh, place, uh, creating these embroideries by, uh, which Bianca created and she'll talk a little bit more about them uh, uh, right, right after me. Uh, but, but then the question was, well, so what game should happen here? What, 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 are the, what, what, what are the positions that, 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 that should be explored in these uh, canvases? And the positions, as the video explains, uh, um, uh, have to do with a very famous game that occurred in 2000 between uh, then best player in the world, probably the most, other than Bobby Fischer, probably the most famous player in the world, even at this point, Gary Kasparov, and the rest of the world. 
it, it was one of those uh, games that, that started exploring the, the possibility of the internet as a site where a, a large community of people could play against uh, uh, a single person. And so uh, Gary Kasparov played, I forget how many people at some, uh, it, it was up in the hundreds, uh, all of them voting for the next move. However, in order to even drive home uh, even further the idea of Remix and the idea of possibilities and how Remix kind of uh, 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 explores the unexplored, the embroidered positions and the embroidered moves are not the ones that occurred, but rather are the ones that a chess engine understood as mistakes and had other suggestions as to how Gary Kasparov and the rest of the world should have moved. And with that, I'll uh, give this up to Bianca. Okay, hi, I'm gonna share my screen. That's it. So, hello, you all. I'm Bianca. I'm here in Mexico City. So, thank you all. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Tracy and Gigi, for this. Thank you for everything. And uh, and I also I want to start saying that my English is a work in progress. So be patient with me, please. So, uh, if you have any uh, any questions, I think we are going to answer those questions at the end. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the piece that I made for the exhibition in collaboration with Leon, but also a little bit about my own practices and my work as an art teacher and also as a researcher. So uh, the practices that I have developed in informal and informal educational spaces, like museums, like art galleries, like classrooms, but also in public and shared spaces because those, those spaces are really important for me. So uh, as I speak, you will uh, realize that I have more questions than answers because that is exactly like I work finding all the possible questions to my own answers. That is really important for me. So I already have answers for some questions, but I I have to think in all the possible questions to that answers, but not only mine, but also to my students' answers. So what you see here is uh, the embroideries that I made in collaboration with Leon. And uh, the embroideries show three important moments in the chess match, but also show the possibilities. So what would have, what would have happened if the player had not played as he did? Okay, so that is really important because besides the obvious, like the different materials and the different language, uh, what you see here are, are those possibilities. So those possi possibilities were the remix, were, were the place where you can find the remix. But uh, uh, there was another aspect that I found really exciting in working in these pieces and that was tracing the moments of each piece and that allowed me to make the intangible tangible okay so you can see the path you can see how the pieces move and that was that was really important because i modified the physical and the temporal space and i could be able to see the space as a territory and as a period of time Okay, but um, maybe you will ask, but well, what, uh, what does all this have to do with embroidery? So, uh, well, you know, the textile objects and the textile techniques have always been linked to physical and temporary uh, spaces in which they have been created. Just think about how uh, native com communities link their textiles to their physical, their spiritual, and their ritual territories. Okay, so this is very important. And also uh, think about the different textile pieces that women have created through history within their domestic and their private, their private spaces. And uh, 
to question their access to the public spaces. So that was for me really important and I really find it working in this piece. Uh, uh, this, all, all these ideas talk again about remixing spaces through threads and through fabrics and that was, that is my job. Uh, the point of departure of my work uh, is the educational strategies based on techniques, concepts, and collaborated textile objects. So I'm going to show you a little bit how I experience Remix and how I work with Remix in using these uh, strategies. Okay, so um, for my work, uh, I have a couple of ideas that I want to share with you. And uh, these ideas, uh, show how I develop my own work like uh, like a teacher because the truth is that I'm, I'm more a teacher than an artist and I'm more like a teacher than a researcher. So uh, first of all, I think the pedagogical projects as an artistic projects. So what does that mean? Um, that means that I'm creating art uh, or at least uh, something artistic as a result of these pedagogical projects. But also that means that uh, all my educative interventions are artistic interventions. That is really important for me. Uh, so in those um, working like that, allow me all kinds of creative and all, ki all, all kinds of creative questions and answers to the questions that I have. Um, I use the interventions to remix fields, to remix knowledge, to remix ways to teach and ways to learn. So uh, in my experience, the remix is using concepts related to textiles to intertwine and to interweave not only fabrics and threads, but also ideas, and also to learn something about yourself, about people in general, about objects, about all kinds of things that happen in life. So these three idea, ideas are all the time in my own work. Okay, so also uh, when I'm working in these educative interventions, uh, I'm always thinking about the horizontality between my students and myself, between with uh, the person who I'm collaborated with, and uh, we are we all are in this in we are are learning and we all are teaching. So that is really important for me. Why when I'm working with someone and when I'm thinking about creating educative interventions, and also the idea of collaboration. So uh, I work with my students all the time. So. Everything is a collaboration, right? But because it's not only my work, it's also the thoughts and the hands of my students. So I'm always, I'm all the time collaborating and I love to collaborate because also I use uh, textiles to work and I use the different uh, concepts that are related to textiles to work. So, uh, the nature of the textile work has always been collaborated. Uh, think about the women that come together to embroider. So uh, when, we, when we are doing something, uh, when we are embroidery, when we are knitting, where we are waving, also we are creating a community and we are learning like a community. That's why I use this idea with the textiles. And also, uh, I, I like to, to um, question the spaces, and I'm like to the, I like the idea of appropriation of the space, the public and the private spaces, and also the informal and the formal spaces where you work, where you uh, are, thinking that they put 
in, in the spaces that you are thinking of. Ex uh, now we're talking about the museums, but I also, I like to think about the galleries. I also, I like to think about uh, the classrooms. And I like that uh, the, the, each of student try to appropriate that space. So these are the ideas that I use in my own work. And I'm going to show you a little bit how I use Remix in my work. Okay, so this is uh, this was a intervention intervention that I in collaboration with Leon also. This calls pocket relationship in Spanish was uh, relaciones de bolsillo, and as what we did here was a guided tour using WhatsApp. We just uh, send it a uh, text uh, by WhatsApp in which we ask the participants to map their visit to the show. So they use yarn to trace their path within the exhibition and they intervene the gallery uh, and propose their own route. And you can see here, it, it's, it's a gift, but you can see like the yarn and the path over there. So it was really it, it was really fun because each of the participants become a curator of their own exhibi exhibition. So they propose ways to walk through the exhibition and to question the pieces and the space of the exhibition. This was really really excited to to do it. And like you see, uh, this we they are trying to make a different thing inside inside the gallery. So they were not only uh, expected, they were not only there to see the, the art, they were there to create another thing inside that space. They were questioning the space and they were giving answers to the space. That, that was really exciting. So uh, then this is a, another work, it calls Tresi, that is a, in Masawa, that is a native language. And uh, the idea I'll show you this is because I talk about uh, the link between my educative uh, projects and my artistic projects. So this is a little bit like an example. So there's no difference between one and another. And in here, it was in a small place in a gallery. And I give them, if you see here, there's a small table and you can, uh, you can, here, over here, there was a piece of paper where there was a couple of words in Masawa, and you have to embroider each of the word in this fabric. So while you were embroidery, you, the point is that you learn a new word, and you can take that word with you. So it was like a process, an uh, uh, educative process, because you start without knowing that work, and then you learn that work, and you end, you, when, you, uh, when you finish the embroidery, you know something new. So in that moment, I start to work with language also. So uh, that, was, that was a little bit how I remix the fabrics, the threads and the ideas, everything was shared. Okay, so Leon is here. <laughs> you can see him over there. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this other work. This is called Symmetric and Homothetic. So uh, I, I work with a couple of friends to, uh, to finish this work. And the point, they, this, this was an intervention, and uh, this space was inside the university campus, really close to the University Museum of Contemporary Art. And we were finding a place where we can work. And we were just walking through the space, and we find this, this fence, and we thought it was a good idea to nick over there. So, uh, in this, the idea was use traditional textile designs to teach the students symmetry and homothetic. And uh, I don't know if you know what homothetic means, but this is uh, something about geometric. And I work with Narda Cordero, and she uh, she's a math teacher, and I work also with Marlene. 
and she uh, she is a second grade teacher. So uh, we were trying to teach our students these two ideas, and we show them different designs of textiles, of traditional textiles. We explained them what symmetry and homothetic was, and then we asked them to make their own uh, designs on those fences. We were in a public space, so when they finish, uh, they realized that they have changed the space. And uh, we asked we asked them, we asked the, the people that were there, uh, what they have, uh, how they feel the space change when they start and when they finish. Because they were, uh, they were making some changes in that space. That was a public space, but at the beginning when we start, that space wasn't their space. But when we finish, they, uh, they own the space. They make that space, uh, they uh, appropriate the, this special space. So this was really, really excited. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit uh, a video so you can see the work itself. So it's really it's really short, but uh, it was really exciting to see them work and to see the finished work, and they understand exactly what symmetry was, what uh, homothetic was, and uh, and while when we finish, we just went home, and they one of of the students came back to see their work in that places. So it was really really exciting to find him in that place. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk now, sorry, a little bit about this other space. Uh, like you see, these two spaces are like formal space, like galleries. These are a public space that we make own space. And uh, this is a, a workshop that I teach the workshop name was Textile Mapping of Contemporary Indigenous Communities in Mexico. And uh, this was a really exciting um, uh, experience for me because uh, this workshop take place in Wasem. It's a college in here at university that is located in a space where people who migrate from other states made their home. So uh, there are places where you can find a lot of violence, a, a lot of poverty, but also uh, the people is still tied to their own communities. So that is really, uh, that, that is really uh, beautiful, right? So uh, while we were creating our cartographies, because we were creating a cartography, uh, with different textile traditions and with different traditional garments, the students identified and resignified them, sorry, resignified themselves uh, on their own tradition and on their own origins. Mm -hmm. And while we were working, they talk about themselves and about their experience. And most of the, of the students were women so we talk and share how it was being and live like a woman in our spaces. So although the objective of the workshop was uh, to review textile traditions and their formal elements like color, like composition, like different designs, different technique, techniques, we realized that we needed to create something with this experience itself. It, it was not only about the, the uh, formal elements anymore. It was not only about the traditional garments. It, it was about the experience itself. So what we did is uh, we embroidered the, wor uh, the word woman, you can see over here, but in different indigenous languages. And uh, we embroider it on paper maps of each state of Mexico. You can see here is 
all the Mexican Republic. And here is a little bit about uh, Baja California. So this queku means exactly uh, mujer in Iguani. So uh, when we finish uh, embroidery, the word uh, woman, then we sew them all together and we create an installation. Here is the installation with all the maps and with the other maps, the other maps, sorry, that we had been embroidery in class. So this is really important. So we create a new land and we create a new territory in which we were able to find to find ourselves because I was part of this. So uh, although I was the teacher, although I was the guide, the, th the truth is that we uh, finish with a collaborating installation, okay? And we were using the experience, we, get, we were using the knowledge and we were creating something new. We remix our own experiences and our own uh, languages and our own uh, knowledge to make this installation. So this was really, really excited. I, uh, I still talk with my students. Maybe some of them are over here. So thank you for being here. So this was really, really excited. Okay, now, um, sorry. Okay, now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this work. So, like you see over here, over there. Uh, well, this is um, uh, this is a silhouette of a little race fist. Maybe you can see the silhouette over here. So, uh, I embroidery. I embroider. Sorry, uh, a female profession. Uh, like a nurse or like uh, something that is female. I don't know because in Spanish is so much so much easier. I can put it the A at the end, pintora. So it's so much easier, but it's something like it's female, okay? So I embroidered the stickers I made with these stickers and I pasted it in different places. So uh, like you are able to see here on, here on, this, uh, on this picture, I, uh, I paste it in all the city and in different places. So what I did was, uh, I'm going to open this. I map all the places where I paste the little fist. And you can find it over here. You can go, in fact, I have it over here. You can see the picture you can also see where where is it i hope that i'm not sure if they are still there but also you can find a link and uh, like you see our uh, la, what you find over there is like uh, a link to articles or essays or interesting information about those professions or about i don't know the first teacher or the first uh, female director or the female the first uh, uh, entrepreneur i don't know you can find a lot of different uh, information about this so how i say at the beginning my work all my artistic work is an educative work so you can see in here and also if you want to uh if you want to share your own feast and if you want to paste it all, all over the places i can just share you the link and you can put it over here. So I start, but if you want to collaborate with this, it would be very, very good. So I'm going to share the link if you want to see more about it. Uh, I'm going to stop it. I go back to the presentation, okay? Okay, and um, now I'm going to finish with this. So, um, like you see, I work all the time with language and I work all the time with textiles and with embroidery and with the remix of the spaces and the remix of all these ideas. So, uh, now that we are online and that we can be very close to our students, I, I thought that it was a good idea to keep working with them but uh, in distance. 
So a uh, couple of months uh, ago, I, uh, I was trying, I tried with my students to analyze different kinds of text uh, with all their components and all their uses. So I, I don't know if you know, but the te text is like a need of words. So text and textile has the same, uh, the same ideas. A text is a textile. So uh, we made tangible the textile inside the text. And what we did it was analyze all the text. We find the slang, we find the connotative words, the, the, the denotating words, and we use embroidery and make, uh, and make this uh, textile. And we just find new ways to use the textile and new ways to make these remixes and new ways to uh, also to read the same text. It was really, really funny and it was really, uh, really excited to see my own students work in this. So uh, uh, I think Leon just for, forgot one, uh, one question is, what is remixing my experience? So remixing my experience is to question and to uh, make new things with textiles, with fabrics, with threads, and uh, with all the concepts that are related in the techniques of, uh, of doing those, uh, those textiles. So for me, that is really important. So when I, I just want to add something else, I'm, uh, when I'm working, I'm always asking myself, what do you what do i learn or what do you learn when you learn to embroider to knit or to wave and also what can you learn when you learn to embroider it to knit or to wave so i just want maybe you can answer those ideas and that's my point of departure when i'm talking about uh that my artistic uh, my artistic projects are my educative projects okay so i think that's that's everything. Great, thank you everyone. I'm gonna, um, so if you have, uh, actually Bianca, can you share that link in the chat? Yes. Okay. Thank you. It's over there. Okay, perfect. So um, if you have questions, I invite you to include them in the, in the chat. I think that was, I was really inspired by the questions that you were asking us as well. So if you wanna, um, either of you wanna raise any of those questions back to us, I think that would be also an interesting um, point of conversation. We are at 2.30, so I realize some people may need to leave, but otherwise um, I'm happy to hang out. I'm sure the presenters are as well if we wanna continue the conversation. Um, also, um, the, I put the link in the chat for the conversation next week, which we will, as Leon was talking, we will um, talk more in depth about the classroom projects, the projects that happened uh, mostly during the quarantine when it started. Um, so please register for that, and I will also send each of you a, in, an email with that invitation for that as well. But I'm just going to turn it over to, to all of you if you have any questions, or Tracy, Leon, or Bianca, if you want to present any questions back to the group. There, there's a question in the chat uh, from Soila. Yeah. Soila, would you like to uh, read? Should, should I read it? Or? Como tú quieras. Hi, Leon. Hola, Soila. <laughs> Tracy. Hi, Soila. <laughs> Zoila, you want to share what you were asking? To, it looks like you were asking a question to Bianca. Yes, I would love to make it in Spanish to make it work. <laughs> um, okay, when you, uh, I'm saying like, well, I'm curious about how your positionality changes the meaning of your artwork and artwork together when they are individually 
intersected, like thinking when you're weaving, right? Um, I see I see a very balanced uh, interway in your work as a teacher, educator, and researcher, but I don't, I, I don't know if I heard well that you feel more as a teacher, but then you're, you're more a, an artist than a researcher. And I think that you, like your work brings all that together, but yeah, like how when you're thinking as a teacher, how your work looks as a teacher, how your work looks as, a, as an artist and as a researcher. Okay, so uh, the idea is that everything looks the same. <laughs> exactly, like that's how I start all my works. That's the main idea of my work, that um, I don't find that there's a, a difference between them. So I, um, I los abordo. I Leon. approach them. I approach oh, them, uh, yes, uh, okay, let's uh, see. I approach them in the same way, it doesn't matter because, but I realize that uh, my work, everything that I, I do is more like I'm learning something and I'm teaching something because I'm learning from the others because all the time I'm collaborating. So uh, you, you learn even if you don't want to learn. So <laughs> that's the point. So uh, I realized that I'm a teacher, I'm an art educator. I'm not, I'm not an artist, no, I'm not a researcher. Okay. Well, uh, everything is, is based, everything goes really well, but uh, I'm a teacher. I learn and I teach. <laughs> Thank you. Bianca, and there's also a comment in the chat that the map is asking for permission. Ah, sorry, okay. So, so I need to change. To uh -huh. Yes, um, I'm going to change it. Uh, Ma Hernandez, do, do, do you want me to read it, Maru, or do you want to turn on your mic? Okay, yes, I can, I can pose a question myself. Uh, hello, everyone. Also, I am engaging with all of you from Juarez. And my question is for both uh, Bianca and Leon. And I'm interested on finding out in what ways uh, both of you uh, present your work as a possibility to formulate questions uh, for the audience. And I, I wanted to end in that, but I also included that how important is movement uh, for both of you when we are, uh, observing your work. How important is for you that we are not just uh, static within our own bodies when, when we try to engage with your work? I don't know if I make myself clear. Uh, that's why I wrote it. <laughs> also, my English is a little bit iffy. <laughs> okay, well, I'll start with um, how important is it for me that, that audiences ask themselves questions? Uh, the, the, I, I hate the idea of art as just a contemplation medium. And uh, I feel that if, if, if all that art can offer is contemplation, then it's about a hundred years too late for that to happen still. Um, I, 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 it, 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 it is of utter importance for, for art, not, not only to incite questions, but to allow questions and, 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 and to allow the inquiry of, of the visitor and the inquiry of, of, of the spectator to, 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 to maybe pry it open and, and, and uh, demand uh, some answers, you know, even if they are speculative, even if they are uh, entirely subjective, even if they are uh, in a made up language. Bianca? Uh, okay, so uh, the, the questions. So I think for me, it's really easy because uh, I always start uh, my work and my classes with a question and I always uh, say to my students that maybe they are not going to be able to answer that question and that maybe they are going to have more questions about it. So uh, that is a really, 
a really um, easy way to to walk to work with the questions. And when I'm when I'm uh, creating something, uh, the point is that it's a process. I never give it, like if you see my work. You never have like a result. You never have like an object at the end. You don't. You never have a work of art. You you have like possibilities for creating something. So I think for me that means that you have to question something that you have to think about those things. And I thought also you do ask about the movement about uh -huh. okay for me it's really important because uh, I'm not really obsessed uh, with mapping everything and we make cartographies because for me that is a, that is the way you make uh, tangible the intangible. So for me, this, this is a really important thing uh, that I'm uh, thinking all the time because that is the way I try to look everything from a different point, point of view and to make like the, the smart question Okay, and, and to uh, question everything and to have different answers. So I show that to my students and I try to create all the possibilities for them to make questions and for me to make all those questions and, and to trace paths. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Maru. Uh, pa pa Paloma, oh, should we? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Paloma, would you like to uh, make your question or should I read it out loud? Uh, sure, I can ask it. I was just wondering, you know, like in this time where our whole world has sort of turned upside down about digital spaces, because Tracy spoke so much about the actual space in the museum. And Leon, you talked about when you saw the previous artist in resident, how she used the space and how it was messy and how that inspired you. So I wonder about um, digital spaces. And Bianca spoke a little bit, but of course, if she has something else to say, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. You wanna go, Tracy? The, um, sure. So the, I can speak to, you know, what really, like what happened when we realized that we were having to shut the museum down and um, there was a moment of just sort of like, I don't want to say panic, but I was definitely like, oh my gosh, we've worked so hard to like create this idea and this see and this moment with, you know, it was sort of us or get from us. And, um, Leon and I had a, I don't even know, it was a, a meeting just talking about sort of needs to be in a panic and like how we're changing so fast am i breaking up yeah yeah you're breaking up tracy um then you am okay <laughs> well i i, I think I, I i think i i i know where tracy was going but uh yeah so i'm uh, um the, the there, 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 there's a few things about digital spaces that, that, that uh, uh, interest me uh, deeply. Uh, I, for, for a long time, so when, when I went to uh, uh, study my PhD at uh, Tucson, Arizona, it was a lifetime ago. And, and so I had a completely different life back then. But uh, m uh, uh, much of my family, yeah, yay, yay, Shana, Tucson. Uh, ma, ma, much of my family remained in Juarez while, while I was in Tucson. And this was in 2010 when Juarez was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the history of the city, but Juarez was going through a, a, a horrible period of chaos and, 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 and violence and, and, and just all sorts of destructive energy. Uh, and so, Every morning when I would wake up in nice and safe Tucson, uh, I, I, I would feel guilty of not being in Juarez, where my family was. And so I would spend about two hours every morning uh, in a digital space, uh, uh, kind of obsessively 
looking through uh, uh, news and, and newspaper websites and, and, and news stations, websites and stuff, looking for whatever latest tragedy may have happened in, in uh, that, that previous night or that previous day in my city and looking for streets and looking for names and, 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 and just, just became very much kind of like uh, 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 involved in, in, in that particular digital space. And, and, and so it, it became very meaningful to me very quickly. Today, a lifetime later, uh, I, I actually don't even live in the city anymore. Uh, uh, I came back to Juarez, but now I live out in the country where I grew up in a very small rural town. And uh, a digital space is really uh, uh, kind of my, my, again, my only link to the city. And at this point, my only link to, to my work. Um, I find them to be meaningful and I find them to have their own possibilities and, and to be entirely uh, fascinating as long as we uh, uh, quit asking them uh, uh, to deliver what physical spaces deliver. They are not the same and they cannot be and they will never be. Uh, and, and so in, in, in that sense, when, when uh, I, I remember when, 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 when Arif and, and, and the rest of the museum staff started working on, 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 the, uh, on, on the virtual art show, which is I think where, where uh, Tracy was kind of heading, uh, I, I, I was worried that we were gonna try to uh, uh, replicate the experience that you could have physically visiting, which you can't, and that cannot occur, especially not with artwork like, like, like the one that, 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 that I had uh, uh, put up there that was not about contemplating and that was not about uh, 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 beautiful imagery kind of taking you over because I'm not interested in that and, and I'm not good enough in any medium to do that. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so I was really kind of uh, 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 insistent in, 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 in kind of reshaping each piece into something that could actually be meaningful in, in a virtual space, in a digital space, as opposed to just let it be like that. And so the show that you access online is actually quite different than the one you access physically because that is the nature of reality. Now, uh, I, the, the, the other thing that occurred uh, as we moved to digital it was the, how was I gonna be able to work with, uh, uh, with classes and professors like Gigi, who was one of the instructors that very kindly invited me into her classroom and, and Tracy and, and Megan, uh, who will talk a little bit later, uh, a little bit more on Thursday. Uh, to me, that was never an issue I, 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 because as, a, as, as, an, as an educator, as a professor, for about, I don't know, 15 years now, I've been incorporating online experiences into my classes anyway. So I, I knew that that could happen. And as I knew that as long as we could, again, reshape and, 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 and reconfigure our objectives and, and our experiences, then we would be okay. And, and, and so I don't know if that, um, I think that covers your question, does it, Paloma? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for asking it. Renee, your question is a little bit similar. Do you want to um, raise that question, your question? Yeah, um, so first off, thank you guys so much for presenting. Uh, super interesting, super inspirational. Um, but in the sense that, I mean, we see what the pandemic has done to education and to classrooms and to just public spaces, um, private spaces. So like, like what is our role as educators, as artists, as uh, um, just part of all those communities, like, and even like the university being in such a unique position that it is like a heart, it's like at the heart of Albuquerque. How do then we like extend our arms? And I think Leon, you kind of, mentioned some of that and like the possibilities with the digital classrooms and and settings like zoom 
but like what are your thoughts on say like taking and remixing like the experience of the museum and taking it to a school or taking it to these other environments where we can then like reach more people or, or kind of reach even students like where where they're at and not just like you at a university level but like in maybe elementary and and uh, other like high school settings and whatnot Bianca teaches in like five different universities, so she, she might have a bunch of different questions. I mean, of different answers to that question. You want to take it, Bianca? Okay, yes. Uh, okay. In fact, uh, I also teach to uh, primary school. So, uh, I, not now, but I was when the pandemic started, I, ha I had like 12 uh, primary school uh, groups. So it was really, it, it was, it was difficult, but also um, the idea is that um, all the time you are in front of the screen. So when you are talking to them and while you are giving your, uh, your class, they are in front of the screen and they are, they, in, in a moment, they used to be in front of the screen and to uh, interact with you and with the others in, with the screen. And the way I change that dynamic and in the way I try to um, make them feel something different was to uh, 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 create ideas to, um, para alejarlos, como digo? To withdraw, withdraw. <laughs> to withdraw uh, the screen. So for example, I, I told them, okay, now you have to run to your refrigerator and you have, to, uh, you have to draw something. So they were running all over the house and they were screaming, mom, dad, I need to go to the refrigerator. So then you are inside your, their places and you use their own uh, homes and their own places like a classroom. So that changed the dynamic that you have and you are closer to them and they feel you over there. You, you go inside their homes. And that's the way I have changed everything. For example, uh, also with the last uh, work I show you, the, uh, where I am, uh, we, were this, uh, we were doing this text and everything was so boring because we have to learn about the uses of the, of the text, the uses of the words, and it was like, uh, this is not me. Uh, this is not really important for me in this pandemic. So what I did is to create something that they uh, that in which they can use their hands. They weren't uh, in front of their screen anymore. They weren't. Uh, they were using their hands. They were uh, just like living in their spaces. And again, their their rooms or their their home was the classroom. So I try to like uh, create some uh, different dynamics where they use the screen, where they use the digital uh, um, tools, but also they themselves change their places and remix their places and um, uh, leave their own uh, their own spaces like classrooms. So that has helped me. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> that is a, a really a really cool way to think about it. You are in the screen, but you want them to use their spaces, and you want them to learn in their own spaces <clears throat> and to question their spaces in different ways. So that is really important, and you don't have to see them all the time in front of your screen. And that is really cool because. There's this something, something uh, really uh, emotional that happened over there. So I don't know if I answer your question, but <laughs> that is the way I, I, I try to, uh, to, to um, I don't know, to think in a different way this, this, pandemic, this pandemic and the digital tools, because you need to think about it in a different way. I really love that. Um, Leon, I feel like you did a similar project with Marisa DeMarco and yeah, Lisa, where it became yeah. you kind of asked them to venture into their homes to, to do something. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, to explore and interrogate their own space. Uh, I do a lot of poetry workshops because that, that's uh, w w what one of my main kind of media is, uh, poetry. 
and, and and one that I've developed through these uh, Zoom meetings is I ask people to interrogate objects around them and to ask just just three basic questions. What is an object trying to say? What do you think the object is able to say? And what would you like the object to say? And then in, in kind of like where those three questions uh, uh, converge, somehow poetry can emerge. You know, if, if, if you, if, if, if you deal with it carefully enough and if you pay enough attention, something else that, that, that I would like to, and, and, and so what, 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 uh, uh, what, what, what I did with Marisa de Marcos class ha had something to do with that, but something else that, that I would like to draw attention to at this point is that this uh, 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 configuration of, of, of life, of current life, where everybody's stuck at home, I feel it's a perfect opportunity, especially for, for art universities and art programs in, 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 in undergrad art programs to allow students to uh, bring their art making into their actual lives instead of leaving it as it so often happens in the university. And uh, that happens through so many different processes having to do with the tools that are available to them, with the kind of proprietary software and, and super specialized uh, 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 computers and blah, 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 blah. One thing that this configuration has forced uh, uh, educators and art professors, those who are willing to do it, uh, to, to think about is, well, now that we don't have the specialized tools and the very specific and very expensive uh, uh, instruments at hand, what is art? And, and, and what does art making uh, 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 mean? Thanks. You know, and, and because at the end of the day, I teach in a public university in a third world country like Mexico, where most of my students will not have access to the tools that the university offers them in their real lives. Once they're, they're done with, with school, many of them are unable to continue making art because all they learn is how to make art through these very expensive instruments. And so if we are able to somehow uh, uh, transcend the, 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 the uh, necessity of those instruments, then we will actually be able to uh, uh, let our students take their art home. You know, and, and, and I feel like that's a very kind of a, a specific possibility that this uh, configuration takes. Maybe I just want to add something else. Also to rethink the materials, because when we are creating something, uh, something uh, you, you think you have to buy like the most expensive materials. All, even though that you are in elementary school, you have to buy the, the paint that it costs a lot. So uh, while we are in this, in this uh, pandemic, also uh, you, you teach your students to rethink their own materials, what they can use to make art or what they can use to not to make art, only to make everything they want to, to create something new, to create their own uh, words, to uh, look all, this, all these materials like some kind of possibilities. So that is really important. So for me, uh, I, that's, that's the way I, I was uh, dealing with this pandemic with the little ones, especially with the little ones. That was really, really cool. Uh, but also with uh, the college students, they also, um, they never think about the materials. So now that they, they yeah. can buy them, now they have to think in different ways and mm -hmm. also to uh, something ab about to create possibilities, but also practicas um, sustentables. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sustainable practices. Sustainable practices. So that is that is really cool, and that that those are some things that you can can create with your students, and you can learn from them. But because sometimes they use the materials in a way that you don't have idea. So that is really really important. So you if you let them to work, if you just give them the tools, they will find a way to 
produce something and to create something. So uh, the materials are really important, the materials that they have, re that they can touch, because now that we can touch each other, touching the materials is really important for them. So, well, I that's an idea. Well, I love what Bianca is saying. I think um, for myself that this idea uh, also about the space of the home during this time has become much more prevalent. And I think, you know, before this, we were living, you know, home was really divorced from school and that kind of uh, um, led to the breakdown of the communication between the family, the home and the school. So what I think can happen is this attention to what's happening what the, the home as a place of learning and what are the material, how is the, the home a material in learning as well. So um, I, don't, I think that those are really, really important issues that we can just continue to discuss. Yeah, I also appreciate that you bring the conversation of, I would say materiali materiality, uh, because I have brought a question about budget and classroom administration. And it's not until I have, like personally, like have a, a class with Dr. Gigi, Dr. Yu, I call her Gigi, Dr. Gigi, um, <laughs> that you don't need a lot of things to really teach an idea. And I love how like, she make us understand. I don't know the experience of, of my class of my classmate, but in in, in person personally, the complexity of the simple of the simple things. Mm. So Thank just you. I like now that I have to move on to a student teaching that I don't know if it's going to happen online, I'm praying. <laughs> um is is it was very like enlight enlightening enlightening open it opened my eyes to yeah to the possibility of like wow i can i can teach that way of complexity with simple materials and just that sense of place in uh, your house doesn't need to be also like like i'm in a macro level let's start small so yeah and maybe there's some really positive things that will come. You know, I think that sometimes situations like this force us to sort of interrogate our practice and like what we're doing just because it's what we've always done. You know, so as art teachers, instead of saying, well, we're going to learn about clay today. Well, you can't because your students probably don't have access to clay at home. So then it becomes about, okay, uh, how do we reverse that? Because some of those, so some of those things that we rely on when we teach, those habits of where we begin our curriculum or whatever, I think they need to be unpacked and like revisited. So I think that's really a good point, Zorda. Rene, Adrian, uh, Rene, are you still there? Oh yeah, I see you. Do you want to make the question, Rene, or should I read it? I, I, I can read. Hola, Rene. Hola. <laughs> Hello to everyone, uh, to Tracy, Bianca, and to everyone. Um, I want to try to to make this clear because my English is not very good looking. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, my question is, uh, is for Tracy and for Bianca and for you, Leon. Uh, in, times, in times like this, um, where are your thoughts and your and the issues? Uh, basic education uh, has to confront uh, in 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 time like this. In time like this, uh, for the pandemic and for the programs, the government uh, has uh, applied uh, in Mexico. Um, in, in Mexico, yes, it's my it's my daughter. <laughs> uh, in Mexico, uh, the government uh, applied this uh, Aprendiendo en Casa, number two, uh, where the TV uh, uh, is a main tool to uh, give these uh, objectives and these uh, programs. And also, they have uh, some political and other controversies uh, uh, beneath that decisions, right? But uh, 
in the classroom, uh, there are certain uh, objectives and certain goals. In Mexico, we call them aprendizajes esperados. Um, I don't know expected. How to, expected learn. Uh -huh. No, learn. Uh, the kids, uh, uh, the, the academy and the institution wants uh, the kids learn. They, they have to learn this. Uh, maybe they can forget it uh, in the future, but <laughs> in, <laughs> yeah. Ask me about uh, math, and I, I don't remember anything, but uh, how, how do you deal with this uh, horizontally way of work? Um, and this approach of uh, making more questions and not too much answers when, and I, I, I doing these questions uh, for my teacher perspective. Um, how, how can I, uh, what you thought, how can I uh, share with my colleagues and Yes, uh, this horizontally in where uh, the kids are in front of the screen and maybe with all this chaos uh, are, uh, around this, uh, are around them with a uh, with noise or maybe, I don't know, with er er everything. How the, this or, uh, horizontally way of work can, can, can affect and um, it needs to affect, it needs to be implemented. Yeah, how's that, how, how can how, how it become, uh, not a standard, but maybe it, uh, become more a way of, of, of doing the things in maybe, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna leave it there. Gracias, Rene, thank you. Uh, Bianca, since you're the one with much more experience with basic education, do you want to okay, yes. tackle this? Okay, first I want to say that Telesecundaria Existido has, has been there for a long time. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of people here in Mexico uh, learn everything and they went to school watching a TV and it works in in those moments it works So now I don't know everyone is like, oh no the TV. Oh, no. Well, maybe uh, It's not the best way to approach uh, Education and not basic education because there's a lot of process really important uh, process there, but it's a way to to approach uh, education not the best but it's there and they and it has been there for a long time so well it's 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 um it's a way to um to answer this pandemic so i i don't think it's that bad first of all then uh i think uh i don't uh, Rene, i think you you said you're you're a teacher you are a teacher so while you are in front of the of the screen, the or the horizontality just happened. Just uh, because they they take uh, control of their own screens. So they uh, they take the control of their own spaces and they start asking questions and they they uh, take the control of their of their home. They are inside their home. So I, I just want to tell you that just happens over there because you don't have the control. That's that's for sure. Like a teacher in front of the screen, you don't have that control. You can't say, hey, stop it, they shut up. You can say that. <laughs> That's impossible because they, they know how everything works. So uh, it is is there. So how can you, uh, the horizontality is there? So how you can work with that? How you can try to uh, l like uh, build a, a I'm thinking in Spanish, sorry. Conocimientos significativos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, meaningful, meaningful, knowledge. meaningful knowledge to your to your classroom is that uh, you can you can ask them questions. That's what I did. I asked them questions. I, I asked them what they want to learn. 
uh, although we it's supposed that we have to to teach some things you can also ask them what they want to learn what they have learned all to now what they want to talk about it and just to you can hear what they are talking uh, between them and that that it happens over there for me for me uh, it wasn't really it wasn't really uh, hard everyone is talking about I, this is so hard but with uh with little ones from in my experience was so much easier because think about the first graders they really don't know what happened in the school they don't know what what is the school what is the school about so when you put it in front of the screen and you uh tell them this is a school. So they say, ah, okay, so I have to learn the rules in here. Okay, so if I want to talk, I just turn off my mic, my mic, if I want to see someone, they just find the way to make this a classroom. It's so much, it's so much easier for the little ones because the, they don't know the rules. So it is really, uh, it's different from the, like the in high school because they learn at rules so they think they and they want to be with the others but if you ask them things if you let them talk between them between them because this is the place where they now have a uh, social interaction so if you let them a little bit the control of your a little bit because i know it could be a mess but if you let it a little bit of the control of the questions they can make their own classroom and their own uh, lessons so if you start just show them possibilities and show them uh what they can do with those possibilities there's the horizon horizontality so that's that's a way to do it i'm i'm know that Everything sounds really cool, but when you are in front of the of the screen and they are and they they don't control themselves is themselves is is not that easy. But I I think that they have to learn new rules and they are open to learn those new rules. So just happened, just happened over there because they have control of. Uh, of a couple of things in the screen and in the digital uh, teaching that they don't have in the press uh, in the real life inside the classrooms. And um, I'm um, sorry, sorry uh, for interruption, but I need to ask. Uh, I'm with you. I'm having that same experience. Uh, for me, this is a most easy way to work, and I'm <laughs> really, uh, but not for commodity, but it. it has this so many possibilities and I am uh, uh, for all the bad things that are happening I, I, I consider this is a good uh, option a good opportunity to start uh, rethinking teaching and rethinking how to uh, do things uh, my next one is it, it, my ask, uh, my question it was more for how can you share it to your colleagues and mm. uh, with the bureaucracy and all these things that uh, they always, uh, the, the kids has not been connected and he's in Facebook. Uh, I'm gonna reprobar, I, I don't say how to say failing. reprobar. Uh -huh. I'm gonna fail him, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fail him. Uh, and you have this, okay, I have to, Yes, I, I can do uh, in my classroom, I, in my screen, I'm the boss. So maybe I, I, I can do the, the things I want to do and have a great time. But I'm, I'm not alone, I'm not solitary, I'm part of this uh, system. And that's exactly my, my issue, my problem. How can I, I be more uh, inclusive? I don't know how to say it. My sensitive, my sensitive. Incisive, so, yeah. Incisive, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, thank you for both. So. You're, you're welcome, Rene. Uh, in my experience, there, the, I mean, lost causes are lost, right? And uh, I, I, oh, I love when uh, Paulo Freire talks about how, how a lot of his ideas are not for the people that will not take to them, you know, because, they, they, I mean. And in my experience, and I can only speak through my experience here, uh, the professors that have the hardest time adapting to this are 
were already the worst professors to begin with, you know, because they, 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 they were so rigid and so authoritative and so vertical in every decision and every process and every system that they put in place that uh, they, 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 you know, they cannot stand any questioning of that system. Uh, I, I feel you, Rene, because I work with a lot of that people, so I know what you're talking about. And uh, I think that this, however long this process goes, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's, las cosas van a caer por su peso, we say here, you know, th things will fall by their own weight. And uh, I don't know that we can do anything in the short term. I think that we can prepare ourselves for the long term and continue questioning how we do things and, and, and why we do things. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't have a more kind of like, you know, specific answer for you. But thank you very much, Rene. Rene is a graduate of the visual arts program that, that where I teach, by the way. So I'm very happy to see him here. <laughs> I just think it, I mean, it, I love that so many people <laughs> stayed on for this long of a conversation and how interest, this is one of the, I think cool things that can happen are these opportunities for, cause I see a lot of our students from you and I'm still on the call, um, you know, to think about these big, these things together, I think is really fascinating. So I hope most of you will come back next Thursday as well. Cause I think the conversation's even gonna go deeper. We have another question from Mirela. Mirela, would you like to make it yourself or should I read it? Maybe she's gone. I see uh, her. I'm right here. I'm right oh. here. Hi, Mirela. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, if you think it's too late for people to stay and I can, you know, ask the question next week, I will let you decide. You don't have to take my question. I know it's late. So. I mean, we're, we're here. Okay. How big is the question? Let's yeah. start. Oh, it's the <laughs> hardest question of all. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for putting this together, Gigi, and for the presentations. Amazing artworks. The embroideries are absolutely fascinating. And, and the chess game, it's, I, 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 have, I have to think about it a lot now. Um, I was thinking about the idea of remix, um, and I wanted to ask you, I know I, I'm an art historian. I teach in college, and thank you, Georgette, for telling me about this. Uh, this is amazing. Um, so, uh, but I do have two kids home that I witnessed their learning through mm -hmm. their iPods. So it's um, 10, 10 years old and eight years old. So I, mm -hmm. I understand Bianca, they, they do run around the house and they do build stuff with an apple and an orange and so on. And it's amazing. Um, my question is, it's so interesting that we enter again the, what the, our critics say, the retinal stage where we just look right so artists for for so many years they tried to break that to do performance art to use your body to move around but here we are looking at the screen right again and i was thinking about this strategy of reenactment um leon you said that for you remix is an act of active remembrance right yeah. so in case of reenactment is the same thing you just use your body it's a performative rem remembering if it just one step further if you want from from remix and i was wondering if if you see any value as a as a as a strategy for teaching in reenactment of situations time periods mediums paintings songs i don't know <laughs> uh, depends what we are teaching and my second question is about this this strategy that i learned recently about so i was just hoping that um, you might know more about um, called visual thinking strategies, uh, VTS, mm. which is uh, which is uh, practically is teaching people how to look without, in other words, exactly what you said, Bianca, meeting people regardless of age and professions to where they are are in that very moment in their life. You might be a specialist, or you might be, you might be bilingual. You might be, uh, you know, an immigrant, or you might be. Uh, so uh, through questions, because that goes to to what you both said. You know, the the main point is who are you, and you know what what do you know? So um, 
So th that was my question. Is reenactment somehow, you see, do you see any value in reenactment as a strategy for teaching? And also, are you familiar or do you know more about visual thinking strategies? That's something that interests me and I'm hoping to use it. I just don't know that much about it. I know there is a history behind it, but I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know the field that well, the field of education. Thank you very much again. Thank you for your question. I'll take the reenactment if you guys don't mind, uh, because I feel that there's, uh, uh, there's, there's real value in reenactment, but only as long as the reenactor gets to add their own experience into it. And, 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 um, uh, so, so as long as the point is not to get a, a, a true uh, 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 version, a true new version of whatever they're reenacting, but as long as the, 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 the point here is to add to it. And, and uh, I, I actually, one of the classes that I'm teaching right now, uh, it, it has to do with audiovisual narrative. And so they're, they're doing little short uh, narratives, uh, video narratives. These are first semester students, incoming freshmen. And, and, and many of them have never shot anything in their lives. And so one thing that has happened is that I, I've, uh, through this semester, they, they've, they've been thinking a lot about how to deal with the uh, reality of not having a crew around them because you know, uh, audiovisual narrative usually takes a crew to 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 be produced, and, and and not really having access to a lot of the places where they would like to go and shoot. So a lot of things need to occur within their house, and their backyard, or their restroom, or whatever. And so th there's many ways in which that becomes a reenactment in its own right. So I don't know if that kind of makes sense. Bianca Tracy, do you want to? I I'll, I'll speak to VTS, but I, I don't know. I've not. I've never in my mind. I was sort of going through, and I don't think I've ever used reenactment as a as a teaching tool personally. Um, but I have seen, you know, like Carrie Mae Weems did a really um, interesting project um, about reenactment in history, and um, I, I kind of feel like there's probably a video about it. He was like a speaker, like the key at any, I don't remember what this was like, but she talked about that project as an educational strategy. And she's having uh, her enact, um, reenact historical. So look into that. Project. That's the only thing I could say. Do, do you want to add something about BTS? Sure. The VTS, I would say, um, I think it's a useful strategy. I think that you're right in, in sort of thinking that it meets people where they are, you know, in terms of people who have experienced art for a really long time can use that tool. I think sometimes they get frustrated with it because it's um, uh, maybe a little too slow. Um, but for people who maybe aren't used to looking at art, um, it's really good at getting them to sort of enter those pieces. And I think it also forces the group. I think it's great in groups because it, you sort of bounce off of each other and you sort of, I don't know, you learn, again, you learn. It's a collaborative way of learning when you're doing BTS in a group. I think there are limitations, but I think that's true for any approach to anything, um, you know, like, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, um, this was probably in 2010, is where I did my research and they use a very strict VTS model. Um, so they never really, it's all about questioning and they never really get into, well, if you follow it strictly, never give the audience any insight into the artwork. It's really just about questions, questions, and I think it becomes frustrating. So I kind of feel using the questions is really great at starting the conversation, but then I personally uh, sort of go off and do more than just BTS because I think BTS, if you really follow it strictly, 
You don't tell them anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just, this is what they saw, whether it's right or wrong, you know, or, or whatever. And, and right or wrong to me is like a horrible way to think about looking at art, but um, there's no context sometimes. At least at the, at the MOCA, I was like, oh, they're not giving them any information beyond what the conversation was. And I think that's okay, but some people get frustrated with that. Yeah, I think it has to, it really requires like someone who can facilitate it in a way that takes people into a deeper conversation. Yeah. But if you just ask questions and it becomes just like any other model, you know, like a, um, you know, any other sort of protocol that doesn't really get people to go deeper with the conversation. So that's, I, I would agree with you. I've seen it work and not work. Yeah. So I usually combine it with something else. Or yeah, that's what, that's what I thought. I just wanted to put it out there because, you know, since I don't know much about it, I thought, I don't know if I'm, I'm <laughs> manipulating this in the right way. So I just, you know, pick and choose whatever works for me. But mm -hmm. I found some value in this idea of what do you see and what did you see that made you think about it rather than, yeah, that's exactly what it is, you know, end of conversation. So, um, and I think it's really good at getting people to understand or, or talk about mm -hmm. where their interpretation is coming from. Yes. So it's really about like, what am I looking at? Like, why am I thinking that? And identifying in that whatever artwork that there are things that we read and yeah we take for granted sometimes that we know these things. I, I, I totally agree. I, I, I keep telling them that the, what is in front of you, it's a, more about you than what happened in 15th century. Um, I, I, I think that the, the other very exciting thing about VTS for me is that it, it instantly negates the idea that there's a single way to look at a piece of art. Right. Uh, right. And, and that there's a right way to look at it. Exactly. It, and it instantly validates the experience that a visitor has right. in front of a piece of art. And I find that uh, terribly exciting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. I don't see any other questions. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm really excited about next week. I hope everyone that's here is um, able to join us next week because this is a, a really great conversation that we can keep going. Oh, I'm here actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a parking ticket if I don't leave. Oops, uh, back oh, here. run. Conversation. Run. <laughs> you were running and talking to us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we started our, our conversation of, about parking at UNM. So, um, but thank you, RF and, um, uh, thank you everyone who's still on the call and Devin for recording. So we'll have this recording available um, to share with others. And we hope that everyone here uh, will again register for next week, um, Thursday, so we can keep the conversation going. Thank you very much, Gigi. And thank you, Arif. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Bianca. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Bye. Have a good Bye. week. Thank you. Bye. Adios. 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 <laughs>